Okay, hello everyone and welcome to this Info Informatics Europe webinar. So I'm Pekka Orponen from Aalto University in, in Helsinki and I'm, I'm hosting this webinar for today. So before we, we start the presentation, so, so let me say a few words about Informatics Europe. So Informatics Europe is the Association of European Informatics or Computer Science Departments. And uh, and uh, okay, so that went, that didn't go too well. Sorry. And here is the uh, number and distribution of the current uh, members of Infos Europe. There are 100, about 160 academic institutions as partners, four, four industrial members, and from 34 countries. So we are really covering already very nicely but we wish to, I mean more more departments are always welcome to join and here are basically the the core goals of Infosix Europe is to foster the quality of research and education informatics in Europe promote uh, pan-european knowledge transfer and collaboration uh, between the actors in in Europe engage with society on the nature and impact of informatics and promote quality standards and best practices in in, in the area. And here are some of the activities. This is a mostly a volunteer organization. And this work is mostly performed by uh, okay, scientific volunteers. And there are working groups in many areas, education, diversity, ethics, policy recommendations, career development, industry relations, knowledge transfer and networking. And these are complemented by ad hoc task forces. Um, here are some of the uh, upcoming or uh, recent and upcoming highlights. We just had a, this uh, annual meeting, European Computer Science Summit, where the community comes together to discuss uh, broad topics in the area. We just had the 21 meeting in, in as a hybrid event in Madrid. It's the slides, the presentation are now online on the Infos Europe website. And, uh, and the next meeting will be in October 2022, hopefully live in Hamburg. And so, and we have this, we are very happy to have this webinar series, which are free webinar free presentations given by distinguished keynote speakers on various areas, scientific, but then also diversity, career development, etc. And uh, for um, members of the community, the, the Informatics Europe offers academic leadership development courses, and, and there are many other things. You can find information about, information about all of these on the Infants Europe web page, which you may or may not be familiar yet, but uh, have a look, www.infantseurope.org. Um, and, uh, and please join. So now with that, um, I would like to introduce, um, okay, so. Okay, so with that, I would like to introduce our speaker for, to, for today, the Professor Stanislaw Zivny from University of Oxford, uh, who, who, who works in efficient algorithms and, and the exit borderline between uh, tractability and interactability. So Stanislaw Zivny is a, is a full professor of computer science at the University of Oxford, where he has been a faculty member since 2013. He's also a tutorial fellow at Oxford Jesus College. His PhD thesis in 2020, he received the 2011 ACP Doctorate Research Award, and his research had been funded by the Royal Society University Research Fellowship and NNT Starting Grant. So, Professor Sibney Standa. Oh, okay, before I actually give the floor, so let, let me, I for, sorry, Standa, I forgot to say. So, because of this, uh, uh, Zoom setup. So uh, we would ask you please to um, say your question to the end of the end of the presentation. At point, what point, which point then you raise, you can raise hands, and you are welcome to either present your questions um, either in person. Or I'll give you the floor, or 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 you can write them in chat, and then then I will read, read them loud. So we try to leave some twenty minutes. Oh, sorry, 20 minutes, 10 minutes at the, at the end for the, the Q&A. So now with that, I, I, I close and I hand the floor to Standa. So please, Standa. 
Uh, thank you very much, Pekka. Let me um, share my screen. Um, so hopefully you can see my slide, my first slide. Um, is that okay? Yeah. Um, yes. Can you hear me, Pekka? Yeah, and slide. Okay, very good. So let, great, thank you. Uh, let me get started then. Um, um, so the title of this talk is uh, Power of Algorithms in Discrete Optimization, which is the title of my current ERC starting grant. It's uh, coming to an end. This is its fifth year. Uh, so I will tell you about some of the results obtained uh, um, during, this, uh, during this grant. But let me first start with two um, questions. Firstly, what mathematical structure uh, captures efficient computation? And secondly, what are the limits of uh, efficient algorithms? So answering these questions is, uh, is the holy grail of a theoretical computer science and uh, the goal of my work. I work in three research areas, namely uh, discrete mathematics, combinatorial optimization and uh, constraint satisfaction. And in this talk, I will tell you about a uh, topic that lies very naturally at the intersection of these three. And it is um, convex relaxations. But before I tell you what they are and uh, what the results we have on them, I'm going to start with a motivating example, actually, how I got into this line of work. So let's start with the, the ST min cut problem, which, um, which is a fundamental problem in computer science and mathematics. Uh, it's, a, it's one of the problems we teach our undergraduates about in their first year and second year algorithm scores. And uh, what is it about? Well, you are given a graph, an undirected graph, with uh, two special vertices, source S and sink T. And given such a graph with the source and sink, an ST cut is just a partition of the vertex set of the graph into two parts so that the, the source and sink are on opposite sides. So on the slide, you can see an example and the um, cut is um, uh, denoted by the labeling of the vertices. So uh, some of the vertices have label zero and the rest has label one. Now, given such an ST cut, the size of the cut is just the number of edges going between the two parts. So in the example, these uh, cut edges are um, denoted in red and you can see that there are six of them. So the size of this particular ST cut is uh, six. And uh, the goal is to find a uh, ST cut of the smallest possible size. Now, um, if you try to write this down mathematically, it's a minimization problem where you minimize over all possible assignments of zero and ones, denoting the two sides of the cut to the uh, vertices of the graph. Um, subject to the condition that S and T get assigned, uh, different, uh, get assigned to different parts. And the objective function that is being minimized is, um, is uh, given by a sum ranging over the edges of the graph. And for each edge, there's a function, fairly simple function phi, that takes the two endpoints of the edge or the variables corresponding to the endpoints of the edge and uh, returns one, if the values are different and zero otherwise. In other words, it counts for one if the edge is being cut. And um, there's a lot of known about this problem, you know, efficient algorithms, structural mathematical result and so on. And if you ask yourself, what is the reason that we know so much about this problem? Why is it tractable? What is the underlying mathematical structure? It turns out to be this innocently looking inequality, which um, has a name. It's called um, the submodularity property. It's a, it's a concept coming from uh, combinatorial optimization. It's uh, sometimes called the discrete analog of uh, convexity, although submodular functions uh, inherit uh, properties both from convex and concave functions. It's a very fundamental topic. And uh, a couple of years ago, I was interested in the question of what other problems, apart from ST MinCut, um, can be solved efficiently. And when I say problems like ST MinCut, I mean, you know, problems where, which you can think of intuitively as um, optimization problems on hypergraphs of some fixed uniformity, so averages of some fixed um, size. Um, you try to assign uh, uh, one of the finite lemony labels to the vertices of the hypergraph and you minimize a sum, which is given by a sum over all hyperedges. So this line of work has uh, attracted uh, quite some attention um, by various communities. And uh, eventually, uh, with my uh, friend and colleague, Johan Tapper from uh, Paris, we managed to obtain a complete classification. So here's the, uh, here's the theorem. Um, informally, we um, formulated the class of problems as a uh, constraint satisfaction problems. And uh, for a class of CSPs, 
with the rational valued functions, we prove that if certain condition is satisfied, then the class of problems can be solved exactly in polynomial time. And if the condition is not satisfied, uh, then the class of problems is NP complete. So uh, the first thing I want to say about this theorem is that you know, it's a dichotomy, by which I mean there are only two possible cases. So this should not be taken for granted. Um, assuming P is not equal to NP by Leibniz theorem, we know there are infinitely many intermediate languages. Uh, but in this case, for this class of problems, this doesn't happen. Uh, there are only tractable and NP-complete problems. Um, a second remark on this theorem is that what is this condition? I'm not going to define it. It's a fairly technical condition, but it's a condition that can be explained in terms of linear inequalities satisfied by the functions in the, in the instance. So it's something more general than submodularity. In fact, it was conjectured for a while that the submodularity is the only reason for uh, tractability of these types of problems, but it's not true. There are more general notions of tractability. And the final remark on this theorem is that all the tractable cases are actually solved by the same algorithm. It's the basic linear programming relaxation. Um, so there's this notion of an universal algorithm that takes care of all the tractable cases. So I think that's quite nice. Um, but in fact, that's one of the reasons why we managed to prove this theorem. Uh, if, it, if, it, if, it, if this wasn't the case, uh, I'm not sure whether we would manage somehow. The rough idea of the proof is that because we had a characterization when the basic linear programming relaxation works for this class of problems, we could take the condition when it doesn't work and turn it with a lot of work, but nevertheless into an NP hardness uh, result. So um, this is how I got into this area, but uh, let me now tell you more broadly, what are these convex relaxations? So convex relaxations is a simple, but very powerful idea. So you have an optimization problem. Say you want to minimize um, objective function f over some domain, omega. And uh, without any assumptions on the um, function and the domain, this is a very intractable problem. So the idea of convex relaxations is that you turn it into a nice problem, into a convex problem, you know, minimization problem of a convex function on a convex domain. And because it's nice, it's convex, you can solve it uh, optimally and you can get a solution or the value of an optimal solution or an approximation of it. And then, and this is usually the hardest bit, you try to turn this into a solution to the original problem or uh, the value of a solution to the original problem. So the, the arrow from left to right is usually very easy. The arrow from right to left is uh, where the work is. So it's a very simple but powerful idea. It's, uh, it has come up in many different areas, in fact, so these are some of the textbooks I use when I uh, uh, teach our undergraduates and graduates, and uh, uh, all of them have, uh, have um, the idea of convex relaxations in them. Um, and the probably um, most studied in the context of computer science are linear programming and semi-definite programming relaxations. And those are the ones I will uh, talk about in this, in this talk. So we will talk about linear programming and semi-definite programming relaxations, which are applicable to large class of problems, but in this talk, I will only focus on um, constraint satisfaction problems. So applicability of these two methods, linear programming and semi-definite programming relaxations for CSPs. So let me tell you what CSPs are and why they are interesting. So CSPs are problems which informally you should think of as problems where you are given a, a set of variables, a set of labels, and a set of constraints. And the goal is to find an assignment of the labels to all the variables that satisfies and optimizes the given constraints. If you only cared about uh, satisfaction, you would get a uh, some standard uh, decision problems, such as the three coloring problem, for instance, where the set of variables just corresponds to the vertices of the input graph. The labels are the three available colors in the picture, red, green, and blue. And the constraints correspond to the requirement that adjacent vertices should get assigned uh, different colors. Another classical example is um, linear equations over some finite field. So uh, here the variables are the variables of the system, the uh, labels are the elements of the field, and uh, the constraints are given by the equations. Now, of course, linear equations uh, make also sense if the underlying structure is infinite, say the set of rationals or the set of reals, and there's in fact a very um, interesting and deep line of work on infinite domain CSPs, but uh, I will not talk about um, those results here. In this talk, all the domains will be finite. 
if you go beyond satisfaction and you care about uh, optimization, you get problems such as the ST minka problem, which I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, where the um, variables um, of the CSP instance correspond to the vertices of the graph again, the labels are just zero and one, corresponding to the two sides of the cut. And the constraints are, well, firstly, that S and T get assigned different labels and the constraints that um, we saw at the beginning of the talk that uh, um, count the number of cut edges for a given uh, assignment. And finally, one more example that will be a running example throughout the talk, the vertex cover problem in which you are given a graph and you want to find a subset of its vertex set as small as possible, that is a cover. That is to say for every edge in the graph, at least one of its two endpoints is in that subset. So here the variables again are the vertices of the graph. Uh, the labels are just two, say in and out, um, corresponding to whether we um, select or not select a given vertex in the cover and the constraints that, uh, uh, and that make sure it's a cover and it's small as possible. We'll see details in a second. So from these uh, four examples, you may think, uh, you know, CSPs always look like graph problems or problems where you have just two labels. It's just because uh, it's easy to draw them on slides. But so not all CSPs are like that. So um, CSPs have come about in uh, many different communities in computer science and mathematics. And uh, there are sort of these four standard definitions. And although it's not very difficult to show that they are equivalent, it's quite interesting how they came about in, uh, in different contexts and how different communities contributed this, uh, to this line of work. So the first one, um, a VDC definition, is sort of an operational definition, which comes from the field of artificial intelligence. VDC stands for variables, domains, and constraints. And it's the kind of definition when you want to write a CSP instance uh, to a, uh, and give it to a computer. So for instance, in the vertex cover example, how would you write it as a CSP instance in this, in this, in this framework? Well, you have these uh, n variables. If the input is an n vertex graph, say x1 through xn, you write what the domain is, say 0 and 1, corresponding to not being selected and being selected in the cover. And you write on the constraints and the objective function. So here the objective function. Uh, I has um, consists of two sums. And the first sum makes sure that any assignment of zero and ones, so labels from the domain to the variables that corresponds to the vertices of the graph is indeed a cover. So for every edge, there's a term there, psi, which says that at least one of the two endpoints of the edge has to be assigned one. So if both endpoints get assigned zero, you see that the um, function psi evaluates to infinity. So that means uh, such an assignment does not correspond to a cover. And because we will minimize this objective function, uh, this will not be an interesting assignment. So among all those assignments of zeros and ones to, the, to this uh, n variables that have a finite cost, in fact, zero cost, we'll try to distinguish between them uh, by the size of the cover. And that's the second part of the objective function, the second sum, which just simply counts the number of variables that get assigned label one. So this is, a, uh, this is the VDC definition, an example of how you would write a CSP instance in the VDC framework. There are um, these other four definitions. Let me tell you about the homomorphism problem definition of CSPs, which is very elegant probably my most favorite. So you can see CSPs as homomorphism problems between relational structures. So let's start with graphs, uh, which are a very special case of relational structures. For instance, the three coloring problem is nothing but asking the following question. If you want to know if a graph is three colorable, this is equivalent to asking, is there a homomorphism from the graph, say G, to K3, the click on three vertices. So what is a homomorphism? A homomorphism from one graph to another is a map from the vertex set of the first graph to the vertex set of the second graph that preserves edges. So in this case, because the right-hand side graph doesn't have any loops, if two vertices are adjacent in G, they have to map to different vertices in K3 for the homomorphism condition to be satisfied. So we think of the three vertices of K3 as, um, as the three available colors. So in this definition, if you replace the right-hand side by a clique, on say k vertices, we get the k coloring problem. But of course, you can put the, some other graph and then you get a, a more general class of problems, constraint satisfaction problems. 
The vertex cover example, which we saw on the previous slide, can be also cast as a homomorphism problem. Well, in this case, the right-hand side structure is just an edge with a um, loop on one of its two vertices. And any such a homomorphism would correspond to a cover. But in order to find the smallest one, with every such a map, we associate a cost. And whenever a vertex in G is mapped to the right-hand side vertex in the, in the structure called B on the slide, it incurs a cost of one. And we sum over all, so we get the size of a, of a cover in this framework. So um, this homomorphism formulation of CSPs uh, has this nice feature that you can, you know, in all the examples so far, the input was on the left-hand side of the homomorphism question, and the right-hand side was fixed. But you can also turn it around. You can say, okay, what if the right-hand side is the input, and on the left-hand side, say, I put a click on K vertices. Well, then I'm asking, is there a click of size K in my input graph G? So I can capture the K-click problem and in this framework. So I've told you about the first two different ways, but equivalent ways of defining CSPs. And there's two other. Um, you can also define CSPs as a conjunctive query evaluations, which come from uh, the field of database theory. And you can also uh, cast this problem as uh, uh, the model checking problem of the primitive positive fragment of first order logic. So primitive positive means that it's the fragment where you are only allowed to use the conjunction and existential quantification. So uh, there's something to be said about this, uh, this uh, type of problems coming up in four, at least four different areas. And my own theory on why, why this is the case, why CSPs are popular and so studied is because they offer a nice balance between uh, generality and structure. So by this, I mean, on the one hand, CSPs are general enough to capture loads of fundamental and important problems we care about. And I've given you an exam, uh, some examples. But also on the other hand, uh, CSPs are structured enough. So there's enough structure to actually prove some interesting theorems and uh, test our current algorithmic and uh, complexity techniques. It doesn't capture all computational problems. Okay, so that's the plan for the talk. Uh, um, tell you about linear programming and semi-definite programming relaxations for uh, constraint satisfaction problems. In most of the talk, I will focus on the most classical notion when we require that the relaxations should solve the problem optimally. And towards the end, I'll tell you about some approximation results. So we want that we want to take a CSP instance, turn it into an LPRSD relaxation, solve it, and the answer should be the right answer. So when does this work? When does this approach um, work? That's the kind of results um, I and my team are after. So vertex cover is going to be a running example. So again, here it is. It's a, you know the problem of finding a subset of the vertex set of a given graph as small as possible, which covers every edge. So for every edge, at least one of its two endpoints is selected. As any CSP instance and many other problems can be reformulated as integer linear programs. So in this particular case, in vertex cover, it's a very simple integer linear program. It looks like this. You have a variable for every vertex. It takes value 0, 1, again, corresponding to whether it's selected in the cover or not. The linear constraints are that every edge is covered. So that corresponds to the um, first um, inequality, xu plus xv is at least 1. And the objective function of this integer linear program is that we minimize the number of vertices being selected. So we just reformulate an NP-complete problem from, you know, from a graph theoretical formulation to an ILP formulation. So we haven't helped ourselves much. But what you can do, and this is the idea of convex relaxation, is to relax the integrality requirement. So if we drop the requirement that x v should be either 0, 1, and replace it by saying it's, say, a real number between 0 and 1, we, we get a linear program. A linear program can be solved uh, efficiently, in particular in polynomial time. And you can ask, when does this work? When does this work that I solve the linear program and it gives me the right answer? So uh, together with uh, uh, Vladimir Kolmogorov from IST Austria and Johan Tapper, we gave a precise characterization when the basic linear programming relaxation works for constraint satisfaction problems that are allowed to take functions that take either rational values or infinite values. 
So it in, in, includes um, decision problems, optimization problems, and in fact, this class of CSPs that uh, allows rational and infinite values functions is sometimes called general value CSPs, as, as general as it can get when it comes to CSPs. So what you see on the on the slide is a, a, a relaxation. It's the basic linear program relaxation. It's a, it's sort of the standard way of uh, getting an LP relaxation. There's a procedure how to get it. You turn your uh, instance into an ILP and drop the integrality constraints. So I'm not going to tell you what the condition is, but the point is that the condition is on the functions of the CSP instance. So uh, if you remember the formulation of the CSP, there are these two functions used uh, when defining the problem, uh, psi and tau. And the condition is on these functions. And it's a, it's a condition that can be expressed in uh, terms of linear inequalities. It has something to do with the um, with symmetries of the solution space of the instances. And although it's, we don't even know where this condition is decidable, you know, if I give you a, uh, because it involves infinite limit inequalities, it's actually very useful. So for instance, it's not hard to check that the condition is not satisfied by the, for these two functions, which implies that vertex cover is not solved by the basic linear program relaxation. So this is not our result. This result was actually known, but the point here is that the theorem applies to all uh, CSPs with rational and infinite valued functions, not just vertex cover. Previous results would often show it for one particular problem and then would use reductions for a few others, but this applies to all CSPs. This theorem um, has been used not only for negative results, impossibility results, but also for positive results. So in particular, there's this notion of submodular CSP. So submodularity has been studied in many contexts and often is studied in the context of uh, functions given by Oracle. In this context, in the context of CSPs, we think of them as uh, the function as being explicitly given by the instance. And um, uh, you can study functions on lattices, and uh, uh, you can study function on non-distributive lattices. And there, the optimization is not quite known in the Oracle value model. But this result, uh, this theorem, implies that um, for explicitly given functions, or CSP instances, even fun uh, submodular functions on non-distributive lattices and more are actually solved efficiently, minimizable efficiently in polynomial time using the basic linear program relaxation. OK, so. Um, from this result, we quite understand how the basic linear program relaxation works. What is its power? What can we do? There are problems that are not solved by BLP, like the vertex cover. Well, there are standard tricks and ways how to make your relaxation stronger. The first one is the idea of adding linear inequalities that make the relaxation tighter, in particular, the idea of the Shirley Adams. So what is the idea? The idea is that you take your linear programming formulation as this one, which corresponds to the BLP. You uh, take some constant, say three, and you look at, in this example, on all subsets of at most three vertices, and you check what kind of covers there could be. So uh, as partial assignments that satisfy the, the constraints, in this case, the one in inequality. And you know, there are uh, three vertices there, each vertex can be assigned to one of the two labels. So there are two to the three, eight options, but only six of them are actually covers. So if you don't select uh, the bottom two vertices um, connected by edge, it's not gonna be a cover and the third vertex is independent. And we add to the linear program, all the inequalities satisfied by these six covers. That's the idea. I mean, the precise formulation, is slightly more complicated. Uh, the details are not all that important. The idea is that you think of the variables as um, um, probability distributions over the integral solutions on small subsets of variables. In this case, it was three. So this is a standard way, this is a standard method. Um, and as long as the, the number of variables you consider is a fixed constant, it gives rise to a polynomial size uh, linear program uh, where the degree of the polynomial depends on this on this constant. So as long as it's a constant, it can be solved in polynomial time. To go over the Antapa, we studied the power of this approach, uh, in particular for which constant k, the k level of the Shirley Adams linear program relaxation solves exactly constraint satisfaction problems with the rational and infinite valid functions. And again, we gave a condition which has something to do with the symmetries of the functions in the instance, 
of the, of the CSP. I'm not going to define it. It's different condition than from before. But an interesting um, part of this result is that this condition, the, the kth level of the Sheldam's LP relaxation works, if and only if the third level works. So this is not true for all problems. It's true for these types of CSPs that if some constant level of the Sheldam's works, the third level will do the job. So you don't have to go any further. So this, this, this um, consequence of our result uh, builds on a, on a very deep result of Barta and Kozik in the context of decision CSPs. So, so I'm, I'm not going to tell you what the condition is, but what I'm going to tell you that vertex cover does not satisfy it. Um, and you know, that's not too surprising because vertex cover is an NP complete problem. You wouldn't expect that there's a polynomial time algorithm. But the point is that this result um, doesn't assume that P is not equal to NP. This is an impossibility result, which says for any fixed K, the kth level of shell dumps doesn't solve uh, the vertex cover problem. So even if P equal to NP, it would be different algorithm. Okay, so um, shell dumps relaxation is not gonna help us with um, with loads of uh, CSP instances, what can we do next? And here comes the idea of uh, semi-definite program relaxations. So the idea is that in the LP relaxations, we think of the variables as probability distributions. And we replace these real valued variables, which correspond to probabilities, by um, vector valued variables coming from some finite, finite dimensional real vector space. And the, the main intuition is that we think of the norms of the vectors as probability distributions, but because they are not arbitrary probability distributions, they have to come from norms and inner products of the vectors, it's a tighter relaxation. And for many problems, this uh, gives you um, gives stronger results. So the, uh, the idea of uh, using semi-definite program relaxations came, came about in 1990s uh, uh, by the celebrated result of Gomez and Williamson, who showed that it gives a better approximation algorithm for max cut than um, previously studied linear program relaxations. But it turns out that for the class of CSPs I'm discussing here, it doesn't actually help. So um, one of the strongest or the strongest known semi-definite programming relaxation hierarchy is called the sum of squares or um, also called the Lacerre hierarchy. And it's similar to um, uh, Shell Adams in that you can build stronger and stronger relaxations. There's a natural parameter, which is an integer starting at one, which is the basic some different relaxation going all the way to the number of variables of the system. And uh, together with the Antapa, we showed this uh, algorithmic dichotomy. So the condition here is the same as from the previous slide. So in fact, for this very large class of CSPs where all the involved functions are, are either uh, rational value or infinite, valid functions, only one of the two things can happen. Either certain condition is satisfied, in which case uh, the corresponding CSPs are solved exactly by the third level of Sheldon's linear programming relaxation, or the condition is not satisfied. And in this case, it's not only that uh, the corresponding class of CSP is not solved by the third level of SA, is not solved by even linear levels of the sum of squares. So this nice constant uh, 1024, that just for illustration, the real statement is there is a constant C between zero and one, such that the C nth level of sum of squares doesn't work. The point here is that the nth level always works. Um, uh, that uh, Then you get the convex hull of the integral solutions. The trouble is that uh, if, uh, if the parameter of the hierarchy is not a fixed constant, it's not clear how to solve this uh, relaxation in polynomial time, because in particular it's of exponential size. So A is a corollary of this result, building on a, on a celebrated work of Lee Rekavandra and Stör from uh, six years ago, because vertex cover does not satisfy uh, this condition um, and is not hence um, solved by linear levels of sum of squares hierarchy. It's not solved by any polynomial size as deep relaxation. So this is, again, this was actually known for vertex cover. This is just an illustrative example. The point here is that this holds for all general value CSPs, which do not satisfy the condition, which I haven't told you about what it is. So little summary of what I've told you about so far. 
I've told you about the power of the basic LP, the Schellens LP, and the sum of squares SDP for CSPs. All these CSPs had something in common. And the thing in common was that they, I fixed, I parameterized by the class of CSPs by the fixed right-hand side. So the class of functions allowed in the instances, like in the vertex cover example, we had these two functions. The homomorphism definition of CSPs suggests other parameterizations. For instance, parameterizing by the class of left-hand side structures, like in the K-click problem. So this is what I want to talk about next. So here's again the K-click problem. So in this example, on the left-hand side, we have a seven click. So this homomorphism question is just, is there a seven click in my graph, which is a problem solved um, easily in polynomial time. And if you want this to be an interesting problem computationally, you need the A to be an infinite class of structures. So you, the K-click problem corresponds to CSPs in which the left-hand side structures consist of all possible cliques. So K sub K for K is from one to infinity. And this is of course an NP-hard problem, but turns out that if the class of structures, although infinite has some nice structure, for instance, it's the uh, class of paths, or more generally, if all the structures have bounded tree width, then this class of problems can be solved efficiently in polynomial time. So this goes back to Freude who made this observation in the eighties, but in fact, this was observed by many other people independently going back to the 60s and 70s. By now, bound, uh, the notion of bounded tree width is well known in many contexts in computer science and mathematics and often leads to tractability. The next result in this line of work was uh, uh, an important observation or uh, result by Dalmau, Kolaitis, and Vade, who observed that it's not the bounded tree width of the left-hand side structure, but of its core. So here we have a, a grid which has a large tree width, but it can be folded onto a single edge. So the technical term is the core. The core of, a, of any bipartite graph is just an edge. You can sort of fold it onto one edge. And that's, well, a graph of a, a tree with one. So the tractability still holds. And then after this result, uh, Martin Grohe famously showed that if this condition is not satisfied, if you look at the CSPs parameterize from the other side, as it often called, so by the class of left hand side structures, whose um, core does not have bounded tree width, then this class of problems is, is not in P, in P time. So here observe that I don't say is NP complete, but just rule out a polynomial time algorithm by assuming stronger assumptions, in particular from the world of parameterized complexity that FPT is not equal to W1. So this is for decision CSPs, what's been known for quite a while. And uh, um, if you want to go to optimization, which was our goal, um, what you can deduce from the existing work is that, well, bounded tree width gives you tractability. That's uh, very easy to show. If, if the tree width of the core of the positive part of the structure is unbounded, then the problem is not in P time. In particular, it's W1 hard. And our goal was to identify where exactly lies the tractability boundary. Is it on the blue line? Is it on the red line? Is it somewhere in between? So if you, look at, if you look again at the grid case and we throw in some numbers to get some optimization um, problem out of it, uh, it turns out that here, this can be still solved in polynomial time, but actually the tree width of, the, of, the, of this class of structures, grids with say ones everywhere is infinite. So th this example tells us that the tractability boundary is gonna be a little bit higher, not on the blue line on the previous slide, but higher than that. And you can also construct examples such as this one, which is again a grid, but with a carefully chosen numbers on the edges, which has the property that uh, in this case, this problem has the tree width of the core of the um, um, positive part of the structure bounded, but actually it's not solved in polynomial time. So the true answer is strictly in between. And the main one of the main contributions of this work was to actually identify this condition. So um, if the tree width of the valued core of the class of structures is bounded, then you get um, tractability and you get a hardness otherwise, or do, do not get polynomial time solvability. So the more precise statement of the result looks like this. This is joint work with uh, my two former postdocs, Clement Cabonel, who is now in CNRS in France, and Miguel Romero, who is now a faculty back in Chile. 
And it says that assuming FPT is only equal to W1, which is a computational complexity assumption, if you take any recursively enumerable class of structures, uh, rational or infinite valued, this is the, you can think of it if it's the class of cliques and it's the K clique problem, uh, then the following three are equivalent. This class of problems can be solved in polynomial time, which corresponds to the running time, the size of the left-hand side structure, which has to come from Cal A, calligraphic A, plus the size of the right-hand side structure, which can be arbitrary to some fixed to some fixed degree. Equivalently, this can be solved in a polynomial time. And this is even only if the class A has bounded tree with modular valued equivalence. So um, in this result, fixed parameter tractability, which is a gen more general notion in polynomial time solvable, it doesn't buy you anything more, they, they collide. But this is not surprising because this, this result, the proof of this result uh, relies on Grohe's result where this was probably the first time where uh, this phenomenon uh, happened. So how does this relate to convex relaxation, which is what this talk is about? Well, when we identified the condition, we needed to prove that it's, uh, if satisfied, the class of CSP is tractable. And the natural notion, natural idea was to consider linear program relaxation, which is what we did. So part of this work is a characterization when um, the Shirley Adams linear program relaxation works. And uh, this is sort of a result which is um, uh, not too surprising. It's, a, it's a probably what you would expect. Um, it says that if you look at the case level of the Shell Adams linear program relaxation and case at least the maximum arity of the CSP and so it's bigger than the arity of all constraints, then the case level works if and only if the, um, the, um, the uh, tree width of the valued core of the structure is at most k minus one. But we went a little bit beyond that, which is what doesn't usually happen in papers. We we also wanted to understand what happens if the level is say smaller than the arity. Uh, so if for any possible k, um, which could be smaller than the arity of the constraints, and then you have to do a little bit of more work. So I, I tried to denote it in red. We had to modify the notion of tree width to something which we call tree width modulus scopes, which ignores scopes of the constraints, and also this condition of overlap of the valued core of the structure. So this is fairly technical, but just the idea was we 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 had to uh, analyze and understand the power of uh, LP relaxations in order to get the tractability part of the of the theorem of the complex classification. So when it comes to exact solvability of CSPs, uh, by now we have a pretty good understanding what happens if the class of general valued CSPs you look at either you fix the right hand side structure which corresponds to fixing the set of functions you are allowed in your instance, or if you fix the class of left-hand side structures, which corresponds to, you should think of it as how you allow the constraints in your CSPs interact, sort of the hypergraph structure, if you like. So, but this was all about exact solvability. So in the remaining eight or so minutes of my, of my time, I'll tell you about very briefly about some of our results, um, which go beyond exact solvability and talk about relaxation and uh, approximation. So, Here's a modern, a modern version of a cartoon from the classical textbook on uh, complexity uh, by Karen Johnson. And if you look in, in this textbook and uh, you know how can you deal with uh, computational intractability, the book suggests two ways. The first one is try to satisfy only a fraction of the constraints. So this gives rise to the idea of max CSP or maximization problems where you try to maximize as many constraints as possible, but it may be NP hard to, uh, uh, to get, it, uh, uh, get the right value. And I will tell you about one particular problem, which is max cut. It's similar to the ST min cut. This time there are no special vertices. There is no source and sink. And we try to find a cut of the a, of a largest possible size. So this is of course an NP complete problem, but the classical result from the 70s shows that in planar graphs, this problem can be solved exactly in polynomial time. And this result was subsequently extended to um, other classes of graphs. In particular, for um, sparse classes of graphs, in, um, namely class of graphs, which uh, can be defined using uh, a forbidden minor, excluded minor, so planar graphs, um, uh, are characterized by forbidding uh, K3, 3, and K5, but you can have other, say, finite many graphs that um, are excluded as minus. Um, so this gives you gives rise to a very natural and robust notion of sparse graph classes. Groha and independently domain at all showed that for such a class of graphs, 
there's a PTAS, polynomial time approximation scheme for the max cat problem. So this means that for any given epsilon, you can find an answer which is a uh, one plus minus epsilon close to the correct answer, but you pay for it by the running time that depends on one over epsilon. Before then, actually, there was a PTAS designed for the dense case when for class of graphs where at least a constant fraction of all possible edges is present in the graph. And uh, our goal was to unify these two. We asked ourselves, how could, how could we unify the case of sparse and dense graph classes? Can we get a condition that guarantees the existence of a PTAS, polynomial time approximation scheme for max cut in this slide, but uh, for us, it was for a class of uh, CSPs and that uh, captures these two uh, fairly different results. So uh, uh, together with my um, two former postdocs, again, Miguel Romero and uh, Martin Rochna, who is now a faculty back in Warsaw, uh, we identified a condition which, is, which we call tree with pliability and which guarantees a PTAS. And it captures these two, these two cases, the uh, sparse and dense cases. And uh, I just want to throw some buzzwords at you. Uh, um, it's an interesting notion. I'll, I'll try to informally define it, but it relates to various concepts studied in the literature, such as um, the notion of fractional tree with fragility, studied in uh, in, uh, in graph theory, and uh, hyperfiniteness studied in property testing, and uh, regularity partitions uh, studied in uh, combinatorics. And the idea is uh, fairly simple. It's a non-constructive idea, though, so it directly is not going to work. The idea is that if you have a class of graphs, say uh, C. Uh, we call it tree with pliable if for any epsilon, which is the epsilon from the PTAS definition, there is a K, a natural number, such that for every graph in the class, you can find another graph whose tree width is bounded by K and which is close enough to the original graph in the D opt distance. And the D opt distance just measures how the two graphs differ when it comes to the value of their maximum cuts. So if G was your input and you wanted to find the value of a max cut. If someone gave you this G prime, because it has bounded tree width, you can solve the max cut problem in polynomial time and you have a uh, one, plus mi one plus minus epsilon approximation of the value. But how do you get it? Um, so um, we managed in this paper to characterize this pretty non-constructive notion combinatorially and use it then uh, to get uh, uh, the positive results. And again, the algorithm is a Shirley Adams the program relaxation, where the level of the of the hierarchy depends on the epsilon. Okay, going back to Geraint Johnson, the other way of relaxing and trying to deal with computational intractability that they suggested was to satisfy all constraints, but not the original constraints, but a relaxed version of the constraints. And perhaps the most famous example of this approach is, already mentioned back in the book, the graph approximate coloring problem. So what is it? Finding a three coloring of a three color graph is NP complete. But what if I let you have more colors? So there's this notion of KC coloring when you are given a K color graph, can you find a C coloring where C is bigger than K? And it's, widely believed that this problem is NP hard as long as um, C is a constant. So constantly many extra colors should not help. So this problem has been heavily studied, but it's, a, it's, it's rather difficult. So, um, you know, th three coloring of a graph that is three color corresponds to the original notion of NP completeness, deciding whether the graph is three color. It's from the seventies due to carp. Um, and then there was some progress over the years and the state of the art uh, was in the 2019, uh, this result due to Boolean and company that if I give you a um, K caliber graph, coloring with two K minus one colors is NP hard. Uh, together with uh, my former postdoc, Martin Rochner, we managed to improve this to this expression where there's a binomial coefficient, but you should think of it as two to the K over square root of K. So given a K caliber graph, um, finding a coloring that uses, say, at most two to the K colors is NP complete. So this is a good improvement on the previous result, but it doesn't solve the problem. Uh, it's believed to be NP hard for any a constant, uh, uh, the second number in the, in, the, in the expression. And also our results only works for K at least four. So 
in particular, it's still open whether, if given a three caliber graph, whether it's NP hard to find a six coloring of the graph, which is guaranteed to exist because the graph is promised to be three caliber. Um, it's known for five, but not for six. So I think given the time, um, I'll, I'll probably finish here. Thank you for the attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Stanga. Um, so, okay. Right, okay, so now we can see everyone. So, thanks once again. And uh, yes, any questions? So you can either, okay, let me first set things so that I can see the list of participants. Right, so now any questions, please raise your hand and speak up. Or if you want, you can also um, write, write in the chat. So, um, yeah. Well, while we are waiting for more questions, so can I ask something about yes. the early part of the talk? So I actually have two questions. So one was, if I understood correctly, so you, there is this dichotomy of CSPs that they are either polynomial time solve or they are NP complete. Right. Which is, is this a consequence of your results or is this somehow known oh, or no. obvious thing? So, so, so um, uh, it's fair to say that perhaps the most famous dichotomy result is for decision CSPs. This is due to Bulatov and independently Shuk was established in 2017, and that's for decision problems. The, uh, the first result I talk about, uh, motivated by ST Mincat, is for class of CSPs that are called finite valued and they involve optimization problems. So it's, a, it's an incomparable result. Mm. Uh, but since then, since the uh, work on CSP started maybe 20, 25 years ago, dichotomies have uh, have appeared in uh, in many contexts. So, you know, uh, there are decision CSPs, there are counting CSPs, you can count the number of solutions, mm -hmm. there are um, optimization CSPs. Mm -hmm. In this talk, I mostly were, uh, talked about um, optimization CSPs, where you optimize some, uh, some function. Okay, and for optimization CSPs, this is now a new result, I mean, new so optimization. Or yeah, yeah. So, so uh, every, all the theorems I stated with the references were were new results at that point. So, for instance, the the finite valued case that's that's now a couple of years ago. That paper was mm -hmm. appeared in twenty sixteen, but th back then it was a it was a it was a new result. Yes. Okay. Well, that's among the many impressive things. So that's I mean uh, one uh, thing to you know put in put in one's mind. Uh, okay. Um, I actually have another question, but let's see if somebody else has, has things to ask. Okay, yeah. Well, let, let me still continue with one question then. So, okay. I mean, I, I was really impressed. I, I had done some work related to CSPs back in the time and, uh -huh. and, and I, I, I like the, the results are somehow very clean and powerful and like the, you know, the best, best kind of theory, I, I think so. so mm -hmm. Uh, but you had this, uh, this kind of this characterization with the three dots, which you kind of yeah, yeah. didn't want to yeah, show. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I believe that these three dots, so they cannot be really testable because otherwise you would just test for, take a problem and, you know, they, they, can, they cannot be computa computably testable. Uh, sometimes they are, sometimes they are. So for instance, the basic linear programming relaxation, the characterizations in terms of certain operations, which have to be symmetric in, in the sense that it's an operation which, if you permit the arguments, returns the same value. And it, it's required that you, uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the class of instances admits a symmetric operation of all possible arities. So this is a condition that is not directly decidable. It's not clear how to decide it. And we don't know whether it's equivalent to something that would be decidable. But for instance, the power of basic linear program relaxation for finite value CSPs is characterized by admitting such a thing, but only of RT2. So as long as you have binary, the, the technical term is binary symmetric fractional polymorphisms, uh, then uh, you are solved by BLP. And this this is this can be decided. This is a mm. if you give me a, a, a class of functions, it can be decided in uh, it's um, in fact un under some extra assumptions, even in polynomial time, whether the condition is satisfied. So it's known as the meta problem. If I give you a constrained language, does it satisfy some nice properties in particular being solved by some uh, linear program relaxation? So it's yeah. not true that it's, it has to be uh, undecidable, but in many cases not known to be decidable. Yeah. 
Yeah, but uh, okay, so let me still pursue this, but even, even though we are coming close to the end of time. So, yes. so basically in some cases you can just plug in the problem description and then you can test whether this is you know, yes. polymer time solvable or not, which seems like a very powerful result. So even in those cases, so is, I mean, is, is this, how, can, can you say anything about the complexity of this testing? I mean, even if it's decidable, so it, is it then hugely super exponential or? Um, let me think. So for instance, for decision CSPs, which is not my result, the tractability boundary is known to be captured by one of the condition says there's a particular operation of RD6. So it would be uh, it would be sort of if you have a class of CSPs that can be the, in which you are allowed to use certain functions or in this case relations because a decision problem you want to test whether this the set of relations that you are allowed in your class instances mm -hmm. whether it has certain operation and it would be you know uh, double exponential in the size mm -hmm. of this. Of, mm. of this of this set of relations so it's only double exponential so it's mm. not too bad uh, um, yeah. but see, I, I think, think somehow from the complexity theory point of view this is fascinating so really like the holy grail of complexity theory you can just take your problem description and you know put it into some black box and the black box will tell you okay is this yes. kind of a NP complete or polymer time so really cool yeah thank uh, you um, I think there's something in the chat. Um, yeah, go ahead. Are there more powerful characterizations than some majority of bone that can be achieved by fast greed? Greedy heuristics. Um, I'm not sure I know that much about uh, greedy heuristics. Um, but but um, I mean, so, you talked about uh, the you talked about submodularity in the beginning of the talk, and then I was yes. wondering if uh, what is the relation between submodularity and the uh, convex re relaxations um yeah so so the the um the, the point that i wanted to make is that submodularity submodular functions can be minimized efficiently using various algorithms uh, they are np hard to maximize but they are good approximation algorithms for instance uh, greedy algorithms and the point was that the convex relaxations allow to solve efficient problems that are generalizations of submodularity so things that look like submodularity uh, but are more general. So one way of seeing submodularity is, uh, if you think of it as a, a property of set function, um, is that this can be cast as just the function of a distributive lattice. Uh, and you can ask what happens if the underlying lattice is not distributive. So then the correspondence is not to set functions, but it's still a well-defined concept. And uh, uh, one of the corollaries of these results on convex relaxation is that, is that such functions can be solved efficiently. Um, uh, one particular point I can give is there's this notion of so-called K submodular functions, where K is an integer. If K is one, it's submodularity. If K is two, is the notion of bi submodular functions and so on. And um, it's not known whether three submodular functions this is more general than submodular, where the three submodular functions can be minimized efficiently in the Oracle value model. But these results on convex relaxations imply that if the submodular function is given to you explicitly as a sum of fixed RIT terms, convex relaxations can be used to minimize them efficiently. So hopefully that somehow answers uh, the question. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it is, yeah. gives me new things to look up. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Okay, are there more questions? Right, okay, so then maybe let's thank Standa again. Thank great you. work, great, great talk, very, very clear and informative. Uh, and uh, this concludes the webinar. Elisabeth, uh, uh, if you, I see you are still in the audience, can you tell us when is the next webinar and, and who is giving the presentation? Yeah, the next uh, webinar is going to be in uh, January. So uh, since uh, we are approaching uh, Christmas time, we will not have uh, a webinar in, uh, in December. Uh, so, uh, and uh, I mean, the date is uh, still to be confirmed, but it should be uh, the 18th of uh, January. And uh, the speaker uh, will be um, a, a faculty from uh, uh, the University of, uh, I, don't know, I forgot the name, Tartu, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, we, I am waiting for the abstract. So uh, as soon as uh, we have uh, uh, further information about the abstract and the title, uh, we will uh, publish uh, this. 
Uh, mm. Meanwhile, I am uh, uh, looking for other speakers, so you are more than welcome to propose uh, uh, new speakers uh, for the following edition, editions. Okay, so stay tuned, follow the Informatics Europe information channels and, and uh, contact Elisabetta Di Nitto if you have good ideas for speakers or want to want to volunteer. Right, so with that, so let us close the webinar and I, I wish you all a good evening and, and a good uh, rest of the week and, and the rest of the year. Thank you. And Thank you now. again, uh, Stan and Pekka. Yes. Take Thank care, you, everyone. Bye-bye.